Today's teaching really focused in on the understanding that we have that um, that the, the Pharisees, the religious elite, the Sadducees, the legal experts, remember Israel is, is a, a country governed by the law of God. So these religious people um, and these sinners are going to um, experience something in their lives and one of them responds to God, the other responds to their own religious standard. Um, what we talk about uh, in the teaching today is that John the Baptist had a baptism of repentance and sinners, tax collectors, and bad people recognized that a baptism of repentance from sin really softened their hearts towards God. They were open to God's message, but the ones who didn't, uh, didn't get baptized, and you see this in uh, Luke chapter 3, the ones who didn't get baptized, the religious elite, all they did was judge John and try to see like why we don't have to listen to him because remember John was kind of a, a kind of a wild cat of a human right he wore a camel skin like tunic a leather belt he only ate locusts and wild honey and he lived out in the wilderness he was a different guy and they were like he has a demon he's bad and they judged him and didn't participate in repentance in the same manner Jesus came and the opposite of John, Jesus was accused by those same religious elite people of being a party animal, a drunkard, and hanging out with bad people too much. And Jesus basically said to him, look, you, you rejected John because he was, you know, he didn't drink wine or eat bread, and he was different. You said, no, he has a demon, and now you're judging me and saying, no, he's just a party animal and does these things. Which one is it? right? They, he's saying you find a way to judge everything and never have your heart softened. You never repent. And what we learn in this teaching today is that the, the heart that repents is soft towards God. The heart that is held to religious rules is hardened and it's justified um, in its own righteousness. It's not got the tenderness that you see in Christ. And we as the church, we have to lean in to repentance and push away from the legalism that hurts um, our lives. Legalism, uh, from the InterVarsity Press quote, was, uh, is this thing. Legalism takes, um, and I think it says it this way. Let me, let me double check so I quote it correctly. Takes, uh, legalism often takes neutral issues of style and tries to turn them into substance. That's legalism. Style, right? And it tries to make that the substance. But we both know, we all know, that in the end, style changes. But what doesn't change is the heart of God for people and the call to repentance. That is continual. So I invite you, get your eyes off other people and quit justifying what's right in your life at the expense of repentance. Turn towards God. Repent, walk away from your sin, and receive the grace that allows you to live freely and lightly. Have you ever prejudged something or someone and ended up missing out on a good thing? Um, I'm going to read this scripture for you real quick. It says this, Jesus, uh, John's disciples told him about all these things. John, calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord Jesus to ask, are you the one to come who is to come or should we expect someone else? When the men, John's disciples, came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to the many who were blind. So Jesus replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the good news, euangelion, is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me, Jesus said. What do you think Jesus meant in verse 23? Why did John's baptism matter for those who would encounter Jesus? Here's a little quote from the InterVarsity Press um, commentary. 
Perhaps if Jesus were ministering today as he did in the first century, some of us, you and I, would complain that he was getting too close to sin. Legalism often takes neutral issues of style and tries to turn them into substance. Do you agree with this? What is repentance, and how is it different from just being, feeling sorry or regretful? Do you agree with the judgment ratio that an unrepentant heart equals a critical and judgmental spirit, which equals missing out on what God's doing? Sometimes you and I don't stop and really take account of all that we've been forgiven for. So even though you're in a group, I'm going to invite you to just silently in your own heart, maybe bow your heads and spend some time listing out quietly in your own heart and spirit, listing out specifically some of the sins that you have been forgiven for. Think of all the things that God has forgiven you of because of Jesus Christ. When we have our sin in front of us, our hearts soften and we recognize the goodness of God. No matter how good we put on religious airs, in the end we just need Jesus to do the one thing we couldn't do. Remove our sin so we could be back in relationship with God. Spend a few minutes right now just quietly and very specifically reminding yourself of all that God's done on your behalf. Hi, Foundry Kids. I have some questions for you to discuss with each other and with your family today. Um, the first one, I love it when I was little and I knew that I was going to go to a friend's house or a friend was going to come over to my house. So... Think about when you have that happen. What do nice friends do when you arrive at their house? In Jesus' day, there were a couple of things that a good host would do when someone came over. First, they would wash their feet because you have to remember they wore sandals and they would walk on dusty, dirty roads. So everybody's feet were really gross. So a nice host would wash their feet. The other thing they would do is give them a kiss when they come in the door. This meant that they were welcome and they were special, kind of like when your grandparents arrive and you give them a big hug. Did Simon the Pharisee do either of those things for Jesus when he came to his house? Let's pretend you had two friends come over. While they were there, one of them stole a piece of gum from you. And the other one stole your favorite stuffed animal that you had had since you were a baby and a brand new Christmas present. A week later, both of those friends come to you and say they're sorry and you forgive them. Which friend do you think would be more grateful for your forgiveness? Have you ever heard the word repent? Repent is different than just being sorry. Repent means you confess or tell God what you've done that made him sad, and then you turn away from it. You turn away from that behavior. You stop doing it. You go in the other direction. When we repent and ask for forgiveness, God always forgives us. How does that make you feel? All right, I hope you guys had fun talking to each other about Jesus. And we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs> Goodbye. Choose for the children, Erica, she walks away. Goodbye. Come back next week. Some of you have asked, um, 
how we take care of visitors here at the Foundry Church. And this is what we know. We know that people decide whether or not they will come back on their first visit within the first seven minutes. Within seven minutes of coming through our doors, they will have made their decision whether or not they'll boomerang and come back. So we have what we call touch points. We greet them at the door. We have an info desk to greet them. We have the coffee and the hospitality. When you come into the worship space, the the person with the foundry loop greets them and gives them a foundry loop, and then they sit down, and we know that our touch points give them human contact before they get to a chair, and they are able to engage a little bit, have some material about us with them. So that's our um, initial strategy. And then um, our main point of connecting is our connection cards. And it's so important that everyone fills one of these out so that the new person doesn't feel singled out. If you joyfully fill out your connection card, when, when you sit down and you do it with a smile on your face, even though for you it's like, oh, we're doing this again, do it for them. Joyfully do it for them because the new person visiting with us doesn't know that um, you're not happy about it when you're like, okay, and you do it, but do it as a service to them so they don't feel singled out. We love to get connection cards from everybody. We put it in every loop for that reason. But it's super important to welcome visitors well for you to do that connection card and turn it in. The second thing we do is um, whenever we have a first-time visitor come to our church, they receive a postcard from us and um, a gift card, a small $5 gift card uh, from Kilwins as a thank you. So a little thank you note for spending a morning with us for me and um, or their campus pastor. So like if you do it at Foundry West, uh, not if you do, when a visitor comes to Foundry West, they get a postcard from Pastor Eric Peterson and a little $5 gift card to kill ones. It's a way of saying we knew you were here. We're glad you took time to be with us to risk filling out the, give, the, the connection card, and we respond by being generous. The third thing is um, when you visit a second time, you have... Um, you get an, and you fill out the connection card, you get another uh, small $5 gift card to like Starbucks or something like that from the staff, from the greater staff, the greater body of the staff that just says thank you so much for uh, coming a second time. You know, if there's anything we can do to make your time better, we love having you here. And it's just a gracious way to uh, receive people and to introduce them to the broader staff family. After four to six visits, we write them an actual letter uh, with information um, and an invitation to Foundry 101. We say, we notice you've been here with us four to six times. We would love to introduce ourselves more um, completely using Foundry 101. So if you're interested, please sign up for Foundry 101. That's how we really work to, it's called assimilate people into the Foundry family. It's an intentional strategy. We work very hard to make sure people are welcomed, that they are greeted, that they are connected with, that they are followed up with, and that they are given an on-ramp to join the family at the Foundry Church. Ooh, that was really good. Ooh, oh. This just breaking across the newswire. I have an exciting announcement about how you as a group can be part of a service project. It is so important for our groups to serve together, to do things together, and to really link arms and serve in practical, real ways within our community. So we are partnering with a couple of other churches for the Feed My Starving Children event. There's so many people going hungry in our community, so many little kids who aren't able to go and get a job and make sure they have something to eat. And we as a church are responding to God's heart for the poor and the needy in this way, and we want to do it via groups. We want groups to lead, the kind of be the tip of the spear of what we do, because you go in as a team with vision and focus for what God's doing. And this Feed My uh, Starving Children event is something we want our groups to get involved in. We're offering it to you and we're asking you please um, help us respond to this need. Be looking for an email from Kristen Berghorst the um, groups coordinator here at the church. She will be sending an email out with the information and the details on this but groups please do not um, miss your opportunity to do something that pleases the heart of God. To meet people in their need with the love of Christ and the gospel in hand. I'm excited to see how many of you respond and how you get involved in this. Grace, peace, and have a great week.
Thank you.